Okay, today what I want to continue talking about, we've been going through a story, and it's in the book of Judges, chapter 6, and, and I've been ta- we've been talking about, this story really goes into a man named Gideon that God raised up to save a whole nation. God raised up a person to save a nation. And we're going to talk about this, that when God wants to reach a person, heal a person, feed a person, take care of a person, teach a person, set someone free, he uses a person. God doesn't send angels to help you. He sends people to help you. So there's a a real important fact that I'm going to drive home today is that when God wants to help people, he sends people to help people. So we are here not just to get help. We are here also to give help. Now, God has chosen to do it that way, period. What I mean by that is there is no other way. When God wants to reach a nation, he wants to reach a family, an individual, a neighborhood, he doesn't do it any other way. He sends someone to reach someone. So God has set this up as a partnership, that we'd be in partnership with him, and he would continue touching lives, saving lives, healing people, encouraging them, giving them hope, but he would do it through people. He would do it through us. If it was just us getting saved and that would be it, we'd get saved and we would die and then we'd go to heaven and that'd be it. But we get saved, that means we give our lives to Jesus, our lives are transformed and God leaves us here because we have an assignment there's more people that God wants to reach. How many understand that? There's more people that God wants to reach. And until you become a participator in your purpose, you're going to be bored and there's going to be something missing even as a Christian. You are here to make an impact in people's lives. And if you don't do that as a Christian, you're going to get bored and you're going to start wondering, what am I, why even go to church? Because you're looking for fulfillment, and I'll tell you, you look for fulfillment, but be careful that you're not looking for fulfillment the way you used to look for fulfillment in the world. And how you look for fulfillment in the world is by being entertained. I'm not here to entertain. I'm here to engage you into your purpose. You guys understand that. And your purpose is what should, it was should fulfill you. Your purpose is what should be driving you. Your purpose is what keeps you happy. Your purpose is what nourishes you. Your purpose is is what you're here for. And without that, there's something missing. So let's look at this story. And we're not going to even, we're not going to even talk about Gideon yet. Next week, we'll talk about Gideon. I promise you. But I am going to talk about how God, just some quick facts. I'm just going to give you two quick facts about reaching people. And just quick quick facts about spiritual life. But let's look at Judges again, chapter 6, verse 6. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Last week we talked about, have you hit your rock bottom yet? And people cry out when they acknowledge, I'm at my rock bottom. Now you could determine in your rock bottom. Your rock bottom could be at this moment or your rock bottom can be lower than this moment. But it's up to you. You choose what's your rock bottom. Some of us are pretty hard-headed and someone right now is asking you personally, have you hit rock bottom yet? Because this is pretty low. And I hope you're saying, yes, this is my rock bottom. I am done living the way I'm living. Something has to change. And if it needs to change, how about right now? When's the best time to change for the better? Now. When is it? Now. Now. Are you done with your anger? Are you done with your addiction? Are you done with your conniving? I just, I, that was a good word to use. 
So, so that speaks to me. I'm a conniver. Right? Are, are you done? Are you done? Are you done with your hustle? Are you done with your manipulation? Are you done with the results that you're getting? Are you done with your depression? Are you done with, uh, uh, the question is, are you done or do we have to go another lap of this craziness? You determine where your rock bottom is. Is there still one more party in you? One more abusive moment in you? One more crazy shift in you? Or are you saying, that's enough of the drama. That's enough of the craziness. That's enough of the hurting. I'm done being hurt, and I'm done hurting other people. I am done. This is my moment. It's up to you. Well, I, I've heard people say, I don't think it could get any worse. Yes, it can. It could get worse in this moment. But I, you know what's, I, what I love about it? It can get better from this moment. It could turn around in this moment. So these people were brought to a place of starvation. And then they cried out to the Lord for help. What that means, they got to the point that they couldn't take it anymore. They were hungry. They had no food. They weren't like, like starving, like some of us say, you haven't ate breakfast. I'm starving. Well, didn't you eat breakfast? Oh, yeah, but I haven't ate brunch. I'm starving. You, you made up something between breakfast and lunch. That's how much you eat. <laughs> what is it? Brunch. But you're not starving. You just want something to eat. But these people were starving. Their children were dying. People were actually, they were in a famine. People were actually dying of hunger. Their kids were like some of those pictures that you see of kids that are dying of starvation in other countries. They were there and then they finally cried out for help. The scripture says that they were reduced to, the, to starvation. They were reduced to starvation. Then they cried out for help. And I want to talk about reduction for a moment. And they were reduced to starvation by the Midianites, as the scripture says. And I'm going to ask you a, a question. You don't have to answer to me personally. Just think about it. Is there something in your life right now that's causing reduction? It's reducing your joy, your peace, your quality of life. Destroying your relationships, your health, your finances, your spiritual life. Is there something that's causing reduction? Because if there's something that was reduced by the Midianites, maybe you're reduced by your anger. Or maybe you're being reduced by that relationship that's very unhealthy. Maybe you're being reduced by... Uh, some habits that you have right now. It could be social media that's reducing your, you're engaging in stuff you shouldn't be engaged in. Maybe you're being reduced by conversations you're having. Maybe you're being reduced by an addiction. I don't know what's causing the reduction, but I'm asking you, is there something in your life that's causing reduction and leaving you empty? Because that's what happened to them. I'm going to give you a fact, and I want you to know this fact, real simple fact. Sin always leads to reduction. So whatever is reducing you that you thought of, I know what it's called, S-I-N. <laughs> sin. God, man, I haven't heard about sin in church for so long. <laughs> now, when I talk about sin, let's not become super spiritual about it. It's super simple. You know what sin is? This is what sin is. The Bible just finds it. If you know, if you know how to do right and you don't do it, it's sin. Like I know I should be doing this, but I'm not doing it. It's sin. 
There's things that you know are wrong because you hide it because it's sin. So sin brings reduction. Not sometimes, always. Temporary pleasure for long-term reduction. Sooner or later, the drug dealer is in prison. Sooner or later, he gets, gets all his money and all his cars and all his sins gets confiscated. Sooner or later, sin leads to reduction. Sooner or later, you do get the disease because of the sexual promiscuity. Oh, Lord, it's getting quiet up in here with a whole bunch of sinners. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But are we talking about life now? We're not talking about, we're not talking about, we're talking about our lives. And I'm asking, is there anything that's causing a reduction in confidence, a reduction in finances, a reduction in relationships, a reduction in your own personal health, a reduction in your relationship with God? Let's identify it so we can turn from it. They finally cried out to God. And you know what's the cool thing about crying out to God? You finally are crying out to God. You're crying out to someone that can actually help you. Because you know how when we're hard-headed, you know what we do? When, we're, when we get consequences for our sin and we start experiencing the depth of our sin or the pain of our sin or the hurt of our sin or the darkness of our sin or the emotional baggage that comes with sin, Sometimes we think the solution is more sin. <laughs> what I need is more sin to make me feel better about the past sin. Cuckoo. <laughs> right? Some of us have actually got to this point. You got beat up and you don't know who beat you up because you were so drunk. Like, who, be, who hit me? <laughs> some of you thought you got someone hit you. You just fell down on your face. <laughs> you hit yourself. <laughs> but this is crazy. When we don't identify that as a destructive behavior and sin, this is what we do. What I need is another drink. I'm not picking on drinking. I'm just saying it's a, whatever that sin is that's messing your life up. Identify it and let's stop the madness and let's stop the reduction right now. So let's read a scripture here in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. It says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. All it's saying is sin leads to death. And when I say sin leads to death, there's levels of death. It could be death of relationships, death of your dreams, death of your joy. But it really means, when it's all said and done, is death of your spiritual life. That sin will disconnect you from God. And sin will disconnect you from his blessings. And sin will disconnect you from his joy, from his peace, from his vision. Sin will disconnect you from your purpose. Sin will dis disconnect you from freedom. It'll make you a slave. But don't mistake yourself into thinking, I could sin with no death. Because I'm the master sinner. I'll make bad decisions and I'm the one that will never have consequences. Come on now. That's what every prisoner says. <laughs> How many get that? How many get that? So we're talking about lies. So sin always leads to this. But, but I love the back half of that scripture. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, You've been on a reduction plan. You've been on a loss. It's been bringing you death. But I have an option. I can give you a new life. 
I can give you a new beginning. I can forgive you of your sins, and I can take you off that path of self-destruction. And it can happen right now, and it's free. I paid for it. And you know who comes to Jesus? People that have messed up, like you and me. You understand that? Has anybody ever experienced some reduction in your life because of your sin? It's only a few of you. Praise the Lord. The other you guys, you need to pray for us because we experience a lot of reduction. I know you're all the spiritual ones, right? But how many know, how many know that science is true? That science is true, okay? So fact number one, sin always causes reduction. I'm going to give you some examples. Sinful pleasures always lead to reduction. Not pleasure. Sinful pleasures always lead to reduction. A reduction of dignity, finances, confidence, faith, influence, honesty, clarity, prosperity, relationship with God. Always leads to a reduction. Look at Proverbs 21, 17. Look at the scripture. It says, love and pleasure leads to poverty. This is what it means. Not everything that feels good is good. Right? Well, I, do you know there's some stuff that you're in love with that's going to kill you? There's some stuff that you're in love with and it's, it's ripping you off. But you love it. And that's the problem with pleasure. It's so addictive. Do you know why pleasure is addictive? Because we were created to want happiness and pleasure. You know what the Bible says? In God's presence, there's pleasures forevermore. So God created you to enjoy happiness and desire pleasure, but there's a problem. The devil knows it, so he gives you False pleasure, destructive pleasure, temporary pleasure for, for eternal reduction. Some of us are in a spirit of reduction. What that means you're not moving ahead the way you should move ahead. You're smarter than the results you're getting. You have dreams. You're awesome. Great personality. And like people are like, like what? And, but you have this secret pleasure that's messing up your confidence. It's messing up your faith. It's destroying clear thinking. How can you come up with great plans where you're, when you've convinced yourself on a dumb plan? Oh, Lord. It's hard stuff right here. I want to be, I want to have great plans, but you're on a dumb plan right now that you convince yourself on. Like this thing is bring, we're going to do, you're going out with a guy that all you've done is abuse you, hurt you, don't want to live for God. I know what I'm going to do. We're going to do it one more time. <laughs> Una vez más in Espanol. Right? You got to understand that? We got to recognize I'm on a reduction plan. It has to change. This pleasure, yeah. I don't know, you know what's so good? Is that when you get saved, God will give you power over your pleasure. That means, I, I know it's hard. It's hard to let go of a pleasure that's reducing you when you enjoy it so much. And you start thinking, can I actually kick that? And God says, when I saved you, I just didn't save you from the consequences of sin, the penalty of sin, the presence of sin, but I'll also save you from the pleasure of it. What he means by that is I'll save you that you'll be able to say no to the pleasure, to say yes to me, to gain a greater pleasure. You guys understand that? It's not just I'm denying myself a pleasure. He goes, no, I'm going to give you the power to say no. And I'm going to give you the power to say yes. I'm going to give you the power to say no to something that's reducing you. And I'm going to give you the power to say yes to something that's going to increase you. 
How many ready to just make a change? Why not now, right? I'm going to give you another example of a, a, a sin that causes loss. Unforgiveness always causes reduction. Could it be that you've been on a reduction plan for years because someone offended you and hurt you and you've not forgiven them and your joy is being reduced, your peace is being reduced, your relationship is being reduced, you don't trust nobody, you're angry, you're bitter, you're edgy, you're cussing out people you don't even know on the freeway. Kicking your poor little dog, it wasn't his fault. Get out of here, dumb dog. My dog, what I do? Nothing. You remind me of that guy. No, that's good. <laughs> Some of you can't even get good relationships because you have not forgiven the past relationship and you're bringing all that baggage into this relationship and it doesn't allow you to love and be real. Cause a reduction. You didn't forgive your mother yet, so now you're becoming like her. Reduction. I'll never be like you. I hate you. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just like her. Because the hate makes you like the thing you hate. Cause it, someone said reduction. Let's look at this story of reduction here. In Matthew 8, 32, look at this verse. It says, then the king called a man in, in the man he had forgiven. So the king, there was a man that had millions of dollars worth of debt. And the king says, hey, bro, I mean, you got to pay me your debt. You owe me millions of dollars worth of debt. He goes, and if you don't pay up, I'm going to have to put you in prison and your family, sell your family off as slaves. We got to pay up. And then the guy says, please, please forgive me. Give me a chance. And the king looked at him and said, you know what? I'll forgive it. And he tells his accountant, take it off his books. The millions of dollars, take it off his books. You're free. Don't get into debt like that again. You're good. But the scripture says that that same man, someone owed him, let's just say a few thousand dollars. And the same thing happened. He's now trying to collect a few thousand. He got, he got charged off millions. And he's now being asked, will you forgive me? of the few thousand. And the scripture says that he goes, no, I'm not going to forgive you. And he put the guy in prison and he made him pay through torture for not paying. Now, now he's standing, I want you to get this. He's standing before the same king that forgave him and it's, now it's gone through the grapevine. You forgave, remember that guy you forgave the million or the millions? That guy, somebody owed him 3,000. And he put him in prison. He didn't even pass on the favor. He goes, where's that guy at? Bring him here. Unforgiveness. What does this have to do with God's forgiving you? So how can you not forgive somebody else? And if you don't forgive someone else, the moment you do not forgive, you are under a reduction plan. You are moving towards starvation. You're going to be in need the rest of your life. You're never going to be happy again. You're never going to have peace again. You're never going to, your family will never move ahead again. You're going to, you can, might make money, but you'll never enjoy it. Now, where do you hear this stuff? But in the house of God, this will save people a lot of counsel in here. Matthew 18, 32 says, the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Should it you have had have, have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. So we see here, it's a story of unforgiveness all the same. That unforgiveness will cause you to lose your freedom. It'll put you in a prison. Unforgiveness will cause you to be emotionally tormented. You'll have nightmares at night. You will not be able to sleep. You're losing your quality of life. And all it was is a sin 
of unforgiveness that's leading to rapid reduction. You know, somebody here needs to go ahead and forgive somebody today. And I'm not saying they didn't dog you. I'm not saying they didn't hurt you. But holding on to it is reducing all your relationships. Okay, so now, fact number one is sin always causes what? Number, fact number two, God helps people through people. And I want you to get this. If we don't help people that are in this place of reduction, they stay in their reduction. So God doesn't just save you, heal you, deliver you. He says, what I've given you, go give to them. Stop walking by that person that's in a ditch and forget that you were in a ditch. And someone came. Hello? Okay, there we go. I thought the devil was trying to shut me down. I was ready to blame the devil on that one. Devil shut down the mic. Yeah, man, I was at church for real, man. Happened. The, the devil shut down the mic. <laughs> or someone's angry over there because I'm speaking of them. I'm like, shut that guy down. No, just kidding. No, just kidding. But, but the idea here is, is that we're, we're talking about reduction and, and someone that needs help that's in that place. And, and I don't want us to become like religious people, like the Bible talks about a story about a Samaritan and they call him, have you ever heard the story or heard the statement, the good Samaritan? There, there was a man that was beat up and thrown, beat up so bad, he was ripped up, robbed and beat up and he was really thrown on the side of the road on the ditch. A religious leader comes by, he's so busy, he doesn't help him. A priest comes by after he you know, did his priestly duties, he comes by, doesn't help them. But the Bible says a Samaritan passed by. And the reason it says Samaritans, because the Jews at that time didn't consider Samaritans as godly people. And he says, this guy, a Samaritan that you guys consider a nobody, that guy stopped at the ditch, pulled him out of the ditch, put him on his donk or his horse, took him to a place to get healed and paid for the bill. He goes, what, what he was saying is, be careful that you're not so church, you're, you're so churchy that you forget about your mission. Your mission isn't just to go to church. Your mission is to get your mission is to get the heart of God and help somebody in a ditch. Don't look down on them, lift them up. Let me get that. So if God wants to help somebody, he what? Send somebody. I want you to do this some practical thing. Write down 10 names of people that you're going to bring for Easter services. Because if you're not intentional about this, it will never happen. Write down on, on that list of 10, do this. Recruit one person for the relationship challenge. And even if you have to pay for them, you pay for them because you love them. I think they should pay for themselves. But if they're not willing to do, the reason I say they should pay for them, because I've learned this, you don't get a return a place you're not invested. People that want everything for free don't ever have a full life. You guys understand that? Some will say invest. It's just basic investment principles. Where you invest, you get a return. You know what's so awesome? Online, you're investing. You're investing here. On, on per, you're investing here. You know what? You're, you're going to get a return. You're going to get a return. You're going to get a, a spiritual return on your life, on your investment today. You're going to get a, a, a return in your emotions. You're going to get a return in your future. You're going to get a return in, come on, your preparation. You're going to get a return in your, come on, in your direction. You're going to return in wisdom. There's a return for this investment. And, and you know what? I'm an investor, so I like to invest the max. Because I like to get maximum returns. Come on, does anybody like to get maximum returns? So let's end it with this. Someone says it's our responsibility. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, let's look at this last verse. It's, it's our responsibility to invite people. It's our responsibility to share our testimony. It's our responsibility to tell someone about Jesus. We cannot be like our society today. 
that they walk by people that are being hurt and just turn to other, turn to other, turn, turn their face and say, it's none of my business. It is my business. Okay, I, I gave an example. It was a, me, me and Pastor Robert, we were driving in, the, in one of the neighborhoods, a real tough neighborhood. And as we come around the corner, there's this guy beating up a girl. I see him beating up a girl. Do you think I'm just going to sit there and like, let him beat up a girl? Well, he's bigger than you. I don't care how big he is. Not on my watch. We're going to do something about him. That could be my daughter. We got too much. We got too much. See, some of us are trying to live too safe to ever be a hero. And when we became Christians, we died for this cause. I died to save a soul. Jesus died to save you. The apostles, every one of them, died for their cause to reach one more soul. That's our heritage. Power to live and power to die. I'm going to get that. Come on. I love this. So I, I, I stopped the car. We stopped the car. Stop the car, Rob. Stop the car. And I go, hey! I do a deep voice. Like, hey! I was hoping the voice would scare him a little bit. He looked around like, what? And he looked at me in the eye, go, what are you doing? He looked at me like, pastor. I go, so I'm your pastor. You're a bad example. You've not been listening, have you? He ran to the car and started crying. And I go, girl, run! <laughs> I did tell her that, run. She ran, go, get away from me, you crazy. <laughs> I told her, run, she ran, was just smart. But he stayed with me. He repented for his sins. He goes, I'm messed up, pastor. Look, what, look at me. I'm out of control. I'm full of anger. Please pray for me. I need to give my back, life back to the Lord because I, he didn't say this, but he should have said this. I'm on a reduction plan. <laughs> and this is my rock bottom. And the midnights are bringing me to self the starvation. <laughs> he didn't say all that, but he did say all that in the message. But I want you to get this. Right now, we're in Africa and our team's over there. There's a huge miracle. Some of, say this with me and we're done. Say this, a miracle before the miracle. The biggest miracle is this, is when God makes you aware of the hurt, the pain, the people that are lost all around you and gives you compassion to do something about it. Because until that miracle happens, they stay in starving, they stay in reduction, they stay going to hell, they stay lost, they stay in their depression. So a miracle has to happen before a miracle. And the miracle is right now we got a team, I'm going to give you this last scripture, but we got a team that's right now in Africa. Some of the people that are out there are business people. That while they're out there, they're not actually making money. But they're in, right now, Africa. There's um, Gary. And this is that man that he's praying for has his hand on his shoulder. They had an outreach on the streets. And the guy comes up to him and, and whispers in his ear. He goes, I'm running an illegal liquor thing. I don't know what he call it. So he's uh, doing moonshine or something like that. So Gary starts sharing his testimony. The guy gets saved. He goes, can you please come back to my place, my illegal place of business, and tell all of them of what you just told me? So this is that. So all these, there's nine, nine drunks that are there, and they're all giving their lives to Jesus. Because someone is coming from San Bernardino, goes to Africa and Kenya to meet up with a man 
that is a rock bottom that needs someone to help you him, help him. He's on a reduction plan, and today he is saved. His life has been transformed because God did the miracle of touching someone to reach someone. And I wanted it with the scripture. I couldn't end, stop it with this other scripture. So let's look at the scriptures. This last scripture. Someone say responsibility. Sharing our faith is not something that we choose to do. It's our duty. Just like it's our, my duty to stop and help that young lady who's getting beat down. Just like it's your duty that if a, uh, one of your family members is being sexually abused by someone in the family, don't hush hush it, put it underneath the carpet. That needs to be exposed. And if someone goes to jail, this is what happens. You save her from the abuse and you save the uncle that's been abusing her from continual abuse and maybe he's going to get saved in prison. I know that might, everybody might turn on you, but we got to get to the point that we're no longer sissy Christians, that we're willing to stand up to save a soul, to save a person, to save the broken, even if it means they don't like us, but we love them. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, we're done with this. It says, telling the good news is not my reason for bragging. What he's saying is, if I'm sharing about Jesus, there's no need to brag about that. And he say, why? Because telling the good news is my duty. And what he's saying is that's the least I could do. It's my call. Sharing my faith is my duty. Telling people about Jesus is my duty. Something I must do. And how bad it will be for me if I do not tell the good news. How bad it would be for me to walk by that person in a ditch and let him die in the ditch and not say nothing. And I saw him every single day. And I was so concerned about people liking me that I didn't mention Jesus in my work. I didn't mention Jesus while the person was hurting. I, what, I let him die. If I preach because it's my own choice, I should get a reward. But I have no choice. I must tell the good news. I'm only doing the duty that was given to me. How many are saying that changes everything? No one needs to thank me for sharing the good news. Even Thank God. He's the one that sent me. But we love you. And it's my duty to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because God cares about you. He loves you. And it breaks his heart. Like it broke God's heart that these people were under bondage for seven years. That he raised up a prophet to speak to them. And said, change is beginning at this moment. And before change happens, God brings someone to speak change into your life. Don't ignore a word from God because this word has the power to change your whole existence in your life forever. Today's your day. Pastor Robert, please close this out, please. Wow, what an awesome word. If we can, let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a second. You're online right now, just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. We ask that nobody leave during this time. Just give us a few minutes to dismiss, if you can. If you have to go to work, of course, you can go to work. And Every head bow, every eyes closed right now. With every head bow, every eyes closed, this message has been speaking to you right now. And you're saying to yourself... I'm experiencing the reduction right now. My joy has went down. My peace has went down. I'm losing more and more relationships right now. I'm, man, that's me. I've been experiencing reduction. With every head bowed, every eyes closed. But you're saying, you know what? I'm done with that reduction plan. I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want God to begin to turn around my life. I need help. Maybe you're facing an addiction right now. You say, man, I can't, can't quit smoking. I can't quit drinking. I, I just want to be done. It's reducing my relationships. It's reducing my finances. It's reducing my marriage. I'm done. If you're saying, man, I, I want God. I want God to forgive me of all of my sins. I want God to start turning things around. I need help right now. I need God. 
All those who cry out to the Lord, God will help. The Bible says all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All those that call out. You're watching us online right now and you're saying, that's me. I'm on a reduction plan, Pastor. I'm done. I, I need help. I want to change. I want God to forgive me of all of my sins. I want to make sure if I die today that I'm going to heaven. I need to make peace with God today. Before I leave this auditorium, before I leave my house, you're watching online. I, man, I need God. I want to be forgiven of all of my sins. I want to make sure if I took my last breath today that I am 100% right with God. If you can all stand up at this time, everyone stand up in the auditorium. You're at home right now, just stand up in your living room. Stand up right there where you're at. If you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I want change. I want God to forgive me of all of my sins. I need to get right with God. I'm tired of this reduction. I take one step forward, then I take 10 steps back. I'm done with that. I want to surrender everything to God today. I'm going to count to three. You say, man, that's me. I want help. I want God to change me. I want God to forgive me of my sins. I want to make sure if I die today, I would go straight to heaven. I choose God today. If that is you, when I say the number three all across this auditorium, don't let nothing hold your hand down. This is you and God right now. What are you raising your hand towards? I need help. I need God. I'm done with this life. I want Jesus. I want him to forgive me of everything I've ever done. I need God today. If that is you, slip your hand up when I count to three. One, two, three. Raise your hands right now. Raise your hands. I see a hand over here in the front. Anybody else over there? Can't see. I see a hand right there. I see a hand in the back. I think I see one, two, hand, three hands over there. See a hand there. See a hand there. See a hand over there. I see one hand over here. I see a hand there. Over to my, my left side, I see another hand over there. All those who just raised your hands, I want you to come forward. Come meet me here in the front. And I'm going to lead you right now in a prayer to receive Christ, to make peace with God today, to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Come on down. Yes. If you're done with reduction, come on down. Say, I'm done with reduction. I'm done with it. Come. You need prayer. Run to the altar. You're sick in your body. You need a healing. Come to the altar. You want to be set free today. Come to the altar. Come. Come. This is your day. Yes, this is your day. This is your day. Come on down. If you need prayer, come to the altar. You need God to restore relationship. Come to the altar. Yes, come. This is your day. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Pastor, why are you counting right now? In heaven, they're counting. They're keeping track of every person that's up here that's going to get saved right now. 14, that's 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. You're coming down. Come on down, sweetie. Yeah, 26 right here. We got 27. Come on, church. Give a big round of applause. 27. We got 28 coming up. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So proud of you. Yes, yes, yes. You're online right now. You're going you're gonna to say this prayer with us. Yes. Another person right here. Another one. Yeah, come on down, sir. This is your day. This is your day. This is your day. Wednesday night, you guys, we just started a new series. We're going through the book of Matthew. We've hit chapter 5 now, and we're talking about how to be happy, how to enjoy life and experience the abundant joy that God has for you. Don't miss it. And we're going to be online, of course, at the interview. It's going to be powerful. Don't miss it. And children's ministry, you guys, don't forget 1 o'clock. That's in about 20 minutes. We're getting ready to open up on Wednesday nights again. 
Kids World right now, we need 50 next generation trainers. We need 50 helpers to help out with Kids World. So we're gonna meet in the North Hall, that's in 20 minutes or so. In the North Hall, you get to meet the Kids World team because after Easter, we're launching now our in-person Wednesday services again. And Kids World right now, we need some more trainers and coaches to train the next generation. Every head bow, every eyes closed. You're watching online, just bow your head right there in your living room, your kitchen, at work, driving a truck. All across the U.S., we got people tuning in from all over the world. Get ready. Your day, your life will never be the same ever again. Your life's about to change. Every head bow, every eyes closed. And you're at your seat right now, and you're thinking, man, what am I doing at my seat? I should have went down there. Your heart's beating fast right now. You're saying, what am I doing at my seat? It's okay. Just say the prayer right there where you're at. God's going to meet you there. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus... I surrender my life to you. I receive forgiveness and I repent of all the sins I've committed. Jesus, come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. Set me free from all my bad habits, all my addictions. Holy Spirit, fill me. From this day forward, I am a disciple. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you just said that prayer, you are saved. You're on your way to heaven. Everybody here in the front, hang out for a few minutes. We're going to pray with you, exchange info. Your next step is starting at the way. You're watching online. What is your step? Go to igotsaved.com. Put your info in there, and we'll help you with your walk with Christ. And the next step is starting at the way classes here. We love you guys. If anybody needs additional prayer, come on down. Wednesday night, online, How to Be Happy, a new series we kicked off last Wednesday. God bless you guys. If God is for you, who could come against you? Have a great week.